I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Last time, we looked at the Ebers Mall transistor model, which analyzes the transistor as a voltage controlled device. With that model at our disposal, we can now look at a whole collection of classic transistor circuits. This time, I'm going to start with one called the current mirror. The current mirror is a circuit that has a power connection and two terminals, the programming terminal and the output terminal. We apply a current to the programming terminal and a load to the output terminal. The load will get a current equal to the applied current. If the applied current is tiny, the load current has the same tiny value. If the applied current is huge, the load current has the same huge value. And the load current is ideally independent of the load voltage. It doesn't matter whether the load is up near the positive supply rail or down near the negative one. The current mirror is a circuit that turns up in almost every analog I see. Often we will have two parts of a circuit that need to have equal currents, and a mirror will ensure that. Often, too, we have a current that represents a signal, but flows in the wrong direction. We may have a transistor sinking current and need a current source instead. You can think of a mirror as either creating two equal currents or reversing the direction of flow of a single current. Oh, I should mention that you can build a mirror with either direction of current flow. One simply uses PNP transistors, while the other uses NPN. So, how do we accomplish this wizardry? Let's start with a transistor with its base and emitter shorted together. We'll connect the emitter to a fixed voltage and run a constant current into the collector and base. We have a rough idea of what ought to happen. Shockley's diode law tells us that the base current will be exponential in the base emitter voltage. We can solve for the base emitter voltage on algebra autopilot. The Ebers mole equation gives us the collector current, and we can expand that out on Algebra Autopilot. This should look familiar, because we saw last time we can derive transistor beta this way. Kirchhoff's law tells us that the input current has to be the sum of the base and collector currents, and we can rearrange terms to show where the input current goes. But we have more work to do here. We've shown that these voltages and currents are consistent, but we also need to show that small perturbations away from the calculated point will cause the circuit to push the voltages and currents back to the point. To show that behavior, let's make our input a non-ideal current source. We can make do without all the calculation. If for whatever reason the base emitter voltage were to rise, that would make the base current of the transistor increase. That in turn would make the transistor's collector current increase, and the increased current would appear as an increased voltage drop across the output resistance of the current source. Which is the same thing as saying that the base emitter voltage decreases, bringing it back toward the calculated value. Of course, pushes in the opposite direction will get corrected the same way. So there's a feedback loop operating to keep the values what we computed. This input circuit is useful in itself. It's a diode with a steeper current to voltage characteristic than a simple silicon diode and it has extremely low leakage in the reverse direction. The big disadvantage is that with most transistors, it can withstand a reverse voltage of only a few volts. By the way, most of the time, if you look at the internal schematic of an IC, when you see a diode symbol, it's actually a diode-connected transistor like this. For various reasons, IC designers love transistors. With all this analysis behind us, the output transistor is almost insultingly simple. The bases of the two transistors are tied together, so of course the base voltages are equal. That means the collector currents of the two transistors are also equal. So the two transistors are going to have equal collector currents. But that's not the whole story, of course. The programming current has to account for the base current of Q1, which is its collector current divided by its beta. It also includes the base current of Q2, also the collector current divided by beta. So the programming current is equal to the collector current times the quantity 1 plus 2 over beta. The output current is just the collector current, 
so it's the programming current times the quantity beta over beta plus 2. For a typical small signal beta of 100, this will give about a 2% imbalance between the currents. That's good enough for a lot of circuits. If it isn't good enough, we'll soon see ways to cancel out the imbalance. All of this assumes that we are starting with nearly identical transistors, and there is no temperature difference between them. This is not too hard to achieve. We need to use a device with two transistors on the same IC so that they see the same variation in the manufacturing process and are tightly coupled thermally. Fortunately for us, there are a bunch of different dual transistor ICs available. But enough talk. Let's build one and test it out. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of the test circuit I'm using. It's a lot like the one that demonstrates the Ebers mole model that I covered in a few videos back. I've placed the schematic on the project GitHub, so you can look up the details if you're interested. The test rig has a few basic pieces. Here at upper left, there's a 9 volt power supply for the transistor emitters. I can't tie them directly to plus 12, because I have op amps connected to the collector and emitter that can't sense that close to the positive rail. This circuit is right out of the LM317 datasheet. Directly below it on the left hand side, I have an op amp current source. I haven't covered these yet, but at this point you probably know enough about transistors to figure out how it works. It's adjustable, so I can test the mirror at a range of currents. I show component values that can set different current ranges. To its right, there's an op-amp voltage regulator. The voltage is adjustable with a pot. In addition, I have a capacitor coupling in my function generator so that I can hook up my oscilloscope and plot the curve for a range of collector voltages. The 10 ohm resistor in the transistor's emitter lead is there to sense the current so that I can plot it as well. Up at top right in the schematic, I have a circuit that senses the mirror's output voltage relative to its positive rail. It consists of a unity gain voltage buffer, followed by a difference amplifier that has a gain of one tenth. Since the voltage difference can easily exceed 12 volts, I can't read it out with unity gain. Difference amplifiers are another topic that I want to cover in the near future, so you might want to consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you don't miss it. Finally, there's a high gain differential amplifier that reads out the voltage drop across the 10 ohm collector resistor to monitor the output current of the mirror. With all of these building blocks in place, I can vary both the mirror's input current and its output voltage and measure the output current across a range of values. So let's go down to the cave and check it out. I have the test setup built up on the breadboard here with the dual transistor on a carrier board right in the middle, and DuPont wires to the three terminals of the mirror. The meter is monitoring the programming current, and the scope is showing the output voltage and current. I'll tweak in a 200 microamp programming current. And I see something unexpected. The output current does stay somewhat close to the programming current, but there's a lot of variation as the output voltage changes. We're going to need to look at this in detail. Let me collect the traces for a variety of programming currents and plot them all together. Well, that didn't work out ideally. The general trend is right. As the programming current goes up, so does the output current. But there's quite a dependence on the output voltage. What's going on here is called the early effect. We touched on it briefly in the episode on current sources. What the early effect describes is that the collector current of a transistor is partly affected by the collector voltage. It rises with increasing voltage. When we look at the current voltage relationship at each programming current level, we see that it's nearly linear. The point where one of these straight lines crosses the voltage axis is called the early voltage, and denoted V sub capital A. If we need to model it, 
we can take the Ebers mole equation and add a factor to adjust for the early effect. But typically, that only comes up in circuit simulation. We don't generally use the early effect, but try to arrange our circuits to minimize its impact. The early effect is worse. That is to say, the early voltage is smaller on small signal, low voltage transistors. It's worse on high beta transistors than on ones with a modest current gain. And it's worse on PNP transistors than their NPN counterparts. Sometimes we have the good fortune that we can ignore the early effect. For instance, if we look at the schematic of our test circuit, we can see that the current source has a low output impedance and the characteristics of the mirror will determine the voltage. There will be some output voltage that exactly balances out the early effect, even accounting for the imbalance created by the base currents. When we look at the curves, it appears that 9 volts is that sweet spot. Since we're running the mirror from a 9 volt supply, this simple mirror would work perfectly going into the virtual ground of an op-amp circuit. And over in the series on audio synthesis, I'm going to add this sort of mirror to our voltage control oscillator to simplify its design. Before I wrap up, I'd appreciate if you could indulge me for a few moments of channel housekeeping. I recently received notification that I've passed YouTube's thresholds for channel monetization. I give heartfelt thanks to all my viewers and subscribers for supporting the channel over the last few months as it began to find its audience. I've made the difficult decision to enable mid-roll ads in some videos. Word on the street is that YouTube doesn't show your channel to as many viewers unless you do that. Nobody likes intrusive advertising, but I'll try to schedule breaks for as little disruption as possible. I'm not looking for fame and fortune here. In fact, if I should ever happen to see a check from YouTube, I'm ruminating over what charity to give it to. In our troubled times, there are a lot of people who need a little extra help. Sorry about the interruption. In the next episode of this series, I'll continue discussing current mirrors and ways to control the early effect and cancel out the small imbalance that comes from the base currents. So I hope you'll stay tuned for those episodes and perhaps subscribe and ring the notification bell so that you'll be sure not to miss them. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!